marriage. Of course, marriage is not your normal pop and face kind of relationship. It brings both excitement and disappointments. If you find yourself married in community of property and often delayed in your business transactions and dealings, worry no more. Because Masinya Tennis uses the law to help you change from in community of property to out of community of property and vice versa. Call Masinya Tennis today on 084 383 7747. We will sort you out with a high court application, and of course, you get to keep your spouse. That's my senior attorneys on 084 383 Aha! So Airpeace has now commenced direct flights to Dakar, Freetown, and Banjul from Lagos. Yeah! So start planning your trip, because Airpeace got you! Lagos to Dakar, Freetown, and Banjul flights will operate on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays with the superb Embraer 195E2 jets. Fly Airpeace from Lagos to Dakar, Freetown, Banjul, and enjoy a world-class travel experience on the brand new E195. For bookings, head to our website, flyairpeace.com, or download the Airpeace mobile app on Play Store or App Store. Airpeace, your peace, our goals. Hello everyone and welcome to Solomon's Temple. This is the time to give you the second part of uh, an analysis of TB Joshua, the truth about TB Joshua by Reverend Chris Okoti of the Household of God Church in Lagos, Nigeria. I must emphasize again, Reverend Chris Okoti was one of the first leaders in Nigeria to voice out his opinion against TB Joshua over 20 years ago. So there has been consistency. And he is a biblical scholar, so he brings a lot of analysis and scriptural um, application and scriptural backup to his contrastion of TB Joshua and Jesus, because that was the plan. You have to understand, in our lifetimes, we get people who Satan decides to use and give them a lot of wisdom, a lot of strategies. And TB Joshua, for me, definitely, he was one of them. A man that was never born again. He said he got born again in his mother's womb. A man that was never a Christian all through his life because everything about him was just around the seat. Just because he carried the Bible, just because he ran a place he called a church, doesn't mean he wasn't part of the grand scheme of Satan to deceive people. A lot of people have lost their lives, lost their livelihoods, lost their faith because of TB Joshua. Enough is enough, not just for TB Joshua, but a lot of other younger TB Joshuas, other aspiring TB Joshuas that are trying to spring up from across the continent of Africa, from Nairobi in Kenya to Accra in Ghana to Lagos in Nigeria or down in Johannesburg in South Africa or Harare in Zimbabwe. Enough is enough. This is the end. This video, what it does is it explicitly reveal the deception, how everything was well crafted. So please, if you haven't watched the first part, I encourage you to go watch the first part after this video. And if you're watching this, maybe you're not watching live, you're watching later, you just run into this. Please go to the first part, the last video before this, that was the first part, so you can actually start from the beginning. And I do hope that we can share this video to a lot of people. Like it, share it, tag people, that is very important. And for us individually, I do hope that this will be the beginning of the end when it comes to any sort of deception that comes around us, our friends, our families, because now we can see. So thank you so much for joining me, everyone, wherever you are. I appreciate every single one of you. 
I got Kate watching from Ireland. I thank you, Kate, so much for coming here. Thank you, Tandy. Appreciate you. Uh, also, I have uh, from Bamenda in Cameroon, Sabo Nana. Thank you so much. Appreciate you. Thank you, uh, Becky, uh, every one of you guys. I wouldn't want to revisit the first part of the video that much. But all I can say is there was a lot of emphasis around the use of images. How images are actually doors that these charlatans and fake prophets use to get into your life. Because the spirit of the prophet, of the false prophet, once you have his image in your house, maybe you have a bottle of water or oil with his image, his picture on it, his spirit will come to you and locate that. You either see it in a dream or things begin to happen around you that shouldn't be happening. You've given them access into your life. So these images that you see, T-shirts, people putting their images, a lot of it is not, I mean, I understand maybe when politics or whatever, but God would not even want us. Remember, he said, we must not worship any engraved image. By virtue of the fact that we carry it with us, we carry that bottle of oil with a photo, bottle of water with a photo on it. That's a form of worship. That's idolatry. And you were given the false prophet the penetration. Chris Okoti, also in the first part, analyzed the way there are biblical patterns that was created through the life of Jesus from Genesis. And for Satan to be able to deceive so many, he has to identify somebody, which he identified in TB Joshua, and use almost the same pattern, but counterfeit pattern, from being a prophet to TB Joshua's name Joshua. Joshua means, actually, if you look at it, the, the, real, the other meaning in Greek is, Jesus, it means Jesus. Joshua himself was a Muslim. He never became a Christian. But people find it hard to believe. Just because he carried a Bible and ran a place he called a church, which was a shrine? No. We must not be that gullible. We must question everything. Question it. Just because you say it's from the Bible doesn't mean that I should accept it. Even as Chris Okoti is going to speak now, question it. Question it. It's okay. God is not going to be angry with you because he knows that you are looking for your truth and the truth shall set you free. And the truth himself is King Jesus. So, let me just go straight um, and watch this video. Again, I want to prepare you. Reverend Chris Okoti is very intellectual, so please pay attention in case you're not at work or doing something that, that you have to do. Uh, and this is an explanation, an uh, expository analysis. You know, when you, when you do biblical exposition, there is the, it's just so much into it. So please, let's watch together as we, maybe once in a while I'll stop and uh, just say one or two things. But again, please subscribe to the YouTube channel and also share this with people. Like the video, just like it right now. Say that you are the son of God, you make yourself equal with God and that is blasphemy. And so they crucified him. So when this man calls himself by Jesus, son of Jesus, he's claiming equality with Jesus. He's saying he's another Jesus. Now you get the point. That's the pattern. He's a magician who pretends to be a prophet. He's connected to the Jews, to the nation of Israel. And he calls himself another Jesus. That's the pattern that Joshua has. He is a magician, a sorcerer, and calls himself a prophet. Notice, he doesn't call himself an apostle. He doesn't call himself a teacher. He doesn't call himself a pastor. Because if he calls himself by any other name outside of a prophet, he does not fulfill the pattern.
So he must stick with that <laughs> appellation. He must call himself prophet so so and so. So that's why he stuck with that word, that name, that terminology, that appellation. Because it is a prophetic assignment appellation. That's why he had to call himself prophet. So he's a magician who claims to be a prophet, but he's a false prophet and calls himself Joshua to identify with the nation of Israel. Right. And calls himself another Jesus. That's what he believes, that he's another Jesus. So he's by Jesus. The same as Jesus, equal with Jesus. That is the pattern that he has in scripture. And that is the pattern he has followed because if he didn't have that pattern and didn't follow that pattern, the power that is necessary for him to carry out whatever assignment that mm. Satan gives to him would not be engendered. <laughs> Are you still here? Then he must follow the pattern of the Lord Jesus Christ in his ministry. Where is that found? Acts 10, 38. How God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all those that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. That's the pattern he has to follow in his ministry. See? So he's, he's another Jesus and notice what the Bible says, how Jesus went about so he's proactive in doing good how jesus of nazareth went about doing good after he had been anointed now the word good comes from the greek word you a a better translation would be philanthropy he was philanthropic the word philanthropy again derives from the greek the first part feel comes from the word phileo and the word anthropy comes from the word anthropos which is mankind phileo means love love of mankind a limousinary propensity a giver so his modus operandi would be that he must demonstrate to people a certain philanthropic disposition because he must follow the pattern of jesus that is why he targeted several people within the society he had people who were building his image his spin doctors who would look into our society the community if anybody had a problem or he was prominent or joshua could use that person to authenticate the veracity of his claims he would invite that person and be generous towards them if you listen to the testimony of the people who met him oh joshua did this for me he gave me money joshua gave me money he gave me money it was always about something he gave because he must follow that pattern of philanthropy hmm. why because satan imitates god it is written for god so loved the world he gave his only begotten son so he must follow that pattern of philanthropy some of you who met him you understand what i'm saying he was always willing to help you somehow somehow particularly some kind of pecuniary blessing that he gave to you so that would induce you to support him as a good man are you still here not only that notice what the bible says how jesus of nazareth went about doing good and healing so there must be healing in his ministry now notice what notice the construction he went about doing good and healing those that were oppressed of the devil for god was with him so the healing ministry must have a proclivity or an inclination towards deliverance see so when you look at the, the, the ministry of Joshua, he has, he has a ministry that involves healing, but with a, with a special emphasis on deliverance because he has to pattern it, you know, after what the Bible says about the modus operandi of the Lord Jesus. Are you still here? I hope you're following these things that I'm saying. Now, once you understand that, you will see the deception in what he did. Now, why did I call him the wizard at Endo? Now, to explain that to you, I must go back to the Bible to explain to you a principle that is called the principle of the last word. Let me say that again. The principle of the last word. In Genesis chapter 3, 
Satan enters into the garden and questions the woman. He says, Ye had God said. It might interest you to know that the first creature to pronounce the name of God in our universe according to biblical history is not Adam. It's not the woman. It's Lucifer. It's Satan. Hmm. And when he came into that garden, he is the first recorded species member of this universe, of this hemisphere, to mention the name of God. And he doesn't call the name of God with reference to the Creator. He says, Hath God Elohim, which is a reference to the Trinity. In Genesis chapter 1, it is written, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That word God there is Elohim, is a reference to the Trinity. But by the time we come to the second chapter, the particular member in the Trinity who is involved with creation yeah. is described as Jehovah Elohim, which is the Lord Jesus in his pre-incarnate manifestation. The word Jehovah is the covenant name between God and creation where there is a relationship. And that is why he introduced himself as Jehovah to Israel because he had a blood covenant, a relationship with Israel. And that's the same way he introduced himself to Adam. Jehovah Elohim, the covenant God. Now, when Satan entered into that garden, if he had called God as Jehovah Elohim, the creator, the one who spoke with Adam, because he's the only member of the Godhead that mankind has ever seen. He's the only member of the Godhead that has had any, any dealings with creation because he was responsible for creation. And that is why when the formation of Adam is described in scripture, it is Jehovah Elohim that is creating him. Out of the dust, the Lord God formed Adam, Jehovah Elohim, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of lives. And Adam became a living soul. Are you still here? Now, Satan could not refer to Jehovah Elohim because if he had called the name of Jehovah Elohim, he would have brought the protection of God into that garden because the covenant that he had between Adam and his wife and himself would have protected Eve in that place, or the woman in that place. So, in mentioning God, he calls the Trinity, which is the impersonal God. And that is the same thing he has done till tomorrow. Every religion talks about God. You can say, God this, I believe in God, I believe in God, I believe in God. Nobody questions that. But the minute you mention Jesus Christ, there's a problem. Right. Because that's the same Jehovah Elohim, the incarnate God. You can talk about God as long as you do not mention Jesus. And that is the precedent that Satan set in that place. But again, back to the principle of the last word. He spoke first, the woman answered, and then he spoke last. And said, you shall not surely die. And when he gave that prophecy concerning what was going to happen, the woman said nothing. So she acquiesced. Silence gives consent in that situation. So Satan spoke last. And he won the day. He made a prophecy. You see, Satan as a spirit can see the future. So when all these guys come and they, they begin to prophesy about things and they say, well, it came to pass. That it came to pass doesn't mean it is God because what Satan said there came to pass. Mm. But that was divination because it violated the word of God. When prophecy violates the word of God, it becomes divination. Are you still here? But again, he, Satan spoke the last word and he won in that garden. Fast forward and observe the battle of Ephes Damim. David is... Sorry guys, he said something about divination which I feel is very key. When a prophecy violates the word of God, it becomes divination. Satan can prophesy. His false prophet, his charlatans that he has chosen to work for him using the church environment, they can prophesy. Satan can see the future, right? But he has his intention because he is Satan. His intention is always wrong. And because they have allowed themselves to be used by Satan, a lot of their intention is wrong. So there's a lot of divination in church. What we see a lot in, the, in church now, we think is prophecy, but it's actually divination. You know, when they will come and tell you your phone number or you tell you their bank, they tell you your banking details or whatever. All that is divination. 
Because a prophecy, what does a prophecy do to a person? Even if it comes to pass. What does divination do to a, pe to a person? Divination a lot of time is just to hype you. It's just to take you to a place, get your trust, and then destroy you. That's divination. But the prophecy is totally different. But a lot of what we see today in church, so much, so much divination. Let's continue. Ready to face Goliath in that battle. Having been authorized by Saul to go represent Israel, he's going towards um, Goliath. But he has to stop by a brook, a torrent in that place, to pick up stones because when he left home, he didn't know he was going to fight. So he has his little bag, his little shepherd bag, where he takes five stones and put them, puts them into the bag. I, I tell my people in church that no matter how encumbered we are, we must always make room for the grace of God. David carried cheese, he carried bread and all other things. But thank God his shepherd bag was open, or was vacant, was empty, so that there was enough room for the grace of Almighty God, typified by the five stones, because five is the number of grace. Now this battle was very, very, very essential. Because this was not just a battle between David and Goliath, it was a battle between Jesus and Satan. Because if David didn't win that battle, Jesus couldn't come here as the son of David. And therefore, he has no title to the crown. He cannot be a political leader. He cannot be the king of Israel. He can be the savior of Israel because he comes through Abraham, but he cannot be their king. Because to be king, he, he must be involved with the Davidic covenant, which makes him a member of the royal family so he can be king over Israel. Can you say amen? Can you say amen to that? So that, that battle was very essential. And if David is going to win that battle, he must go through a pattern, a ritual that Jesus will go through in the New Testament. Now, David has to go through a pattern that Jesus must fulfill in the New Testament. When he gets to the, to the brook, he stoops and picks up the five stones in that water, puts them in his bag, and I've often told my church that you must always make room for the grace of God, no matter how encumbered you are with the tedium of the day. So in carrying cheese and carrying bread and all of those things, he still had room in his bag for the grace of Almighty God. So he goes through that pattern. He stoops, it's some kind of a ritual. He goes down, picks the stones, stands up, puts them in his bag. Jesus is going to fulfill that pattern in the New Testament. You say, where does he do that? In the Gospels. A woman is brought to him in the temple who is caught in the act of adultery. And they say to him, Rabbi, this woman was caught in the very act of adultery. The law of Moses says that such a person should be stoned. What do you say? Jesus ignores them, stoops, and writes with his finger on the ground. They keep talking to him. They keep questioning him. He stands up and says, if there is a man here who has no sin, let him cast the first stone. Mm. Then he stoops again and writes on the ground. Finally, he stands up. At that time, all of them have dispersed because their conscience have indicated to them that they are sinners. And when he stands up, he says to the woman, why are your accusers? Well, finally he says, you go in peace, I do not condemn you. Now, what, what, what did he just do? Let me explain it to you. When they came to him with that accused woman, who is a type of the church, before regeneration, he stoops indicating that his work involved him becoming a man. So stooping the first time was he coming from heaven who had the form of God, but thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation and became a man. That's the first time he stooped. The second time, the Bible says, being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and took on the form of a servant and became a surrogate. He humbled himself even unto the death of the cross. So he stoops twice. First when he becomes man, 
Second, when he takes the sin of the world. And each time, there is a writing concerning him. In other words, these are not just arbitrary things or whimsical things or capricious things. They are in accordance with the prophecies concerning him. Mm. That's why he kept writing. Because the Bible, the volume of Revelation, indicates to us that this is the Messiah. David had to go through that. Because he must go through the process of the death, the burial, the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ before he can bring down Goliath. Because Jesus couldn't defeat Satan until he had gone through the death, the burial, and the resurrection. Are you still here? So when David stands up and he takes the stones and puts into his back, Goliath is seeing him. And the Bible says Goliath curses him in the name of his gods. Now why would a big man of such, with such height and strength and power still he invoked the power of his God because Satan knew that this was a spiritual battle. Mm. See? So, Goliath summons the power of his God. Now, the national God of the Philistines is a God called Dagon. He's half fish and half man. Now, in Ephesians chapter 6, Paul describes to us the, the demonic hierarchy, the satanic hierarchy. It says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. The Greek word is arche. It is that same word that is translated as prince in Ephesians chapter 2, where the Bible says, we walked after the counsel of the, after the course of the prince of the power of the air. Where Satan is called the prince of the power of the air. That is the same word, arche. It's the same word translated as principality. Because Satan is the principality of principalities in his imitation of Jesus Christ as the king of kings. So Paul says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. Ake, the ancient ones, the preeminent ones who went into a covenant with Satan first and foremost, before the others. Then we have the exousias, the authorities. Then we have the world rulers of this darkness, the cosmocrotoros. And then we have wicked spirits in the heavenlies, pneumaticos ponerea. These are wicked spirits that are all <laughs> resident in the air. Now, this is a satanic hierarchy or a demonic hierarchy. But in, in the world of Satan, that is referred to as Ophic demonology. The classification or the taxonomy is different. Demons are classified according to their abode and the areas of their operation. You have celestial spirits, aerial spirits, aquatic spirits, terrestrial spirits, and subterranean spirits. Dagon is an aquatic spirit. According to Philistine mythology, yes, please listen to this. Guys. Are controlled by Dagon. So, in David trying to prosecute the will of God in that place, and he goes to a brook, he's entered, according to the Philistines, into the realm of Dagon. And then he takes stones weapons that he got from the territory of dagon so to speak according to these philistines because jesus has to fulfill that pattern that through death he will neutralize the one who had the power of death and david must go through that pattern so that through the stones that he got in the territory of dagon he can destroy the one who had the power of dagon which is goliath that's the same pattern Jesus went through because death was in the hand of Satan. But it is through death, a weapon of Satan, that Jesus neutralized Satan. So David uses the weapon of Dagon that he got from the sea, from the river, from the brook. And with that weapon, he neutralizes Goliath. But for him to do that, he must bring his covenant God into that place to neutralize the power of Dagon. So he says, you come to me with a sword, with a spear, with a shield, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel that you have defied. And when he summons God's power into that place, he neutralizes the power of Dagon that is on those stones, and David uses the same stones to bring down Goliath. Jesus has to go through that same pattern. But following the principle of the last word, which is what I'm really talking about, David spoke last, and so he won that battle. Are you still here? Fast forward to Jesus. He's in the wilderness. The enemy comes to him after 40 days of fasting and says to him, if you be the son of God, turn these stones that they may become bread. 
Now, the word if is a conditional particle of a fulfilled condition. A better translation would be on account of the fact that you are the son of God. He wasn't doubting the authenticity of who he was. He was saying, I know that you are the son of God. Since you are the son of God, why are you starving yourself? Your fasting is over. You can turn these stones into bread. Now, before I, I even get it, I need to explain what Satan was doing. Now, there were other things that were in that wilderness. But Satan was specific about the stones. He didn't say turn the sun. He didn't say turn the, the tree, turn a branch. He said turn stones into bread. Now, what does that be token? What does it prognosticate? What is the purpose? Simply this. The stones that were in the wilderness are a type of the unregenerated person. The church before its birth. You, before you became a born-again Christian. That's what I mean. So, Satan was saying to him in subtlety, make these stones into living stones and make them into bread. Because he knows that the pattern that is set in scripture is that Jesus cannot birth the church, which is Adam's woman, until he dies and he rises from the dead. Because the woman does not come into the picture until Adam rises from his sleep. So if Jesus turns that stone into bread, he would not fulfill the pattern in the Old Testament. Because you and I, before we became born again, could not enter into a place of close relationship with him until he had died, been buried, resurrected, and ascended into heaven. It was after that that we became living stones who became his body. Remember, at the communion, he said, take it. He took bread. He said, take it. This is my body. That body did not come into existence until after his resurrection. So what Satan was telling him, you don't need the cross. You can just turn this into bread. And if he did it, then he would not meet the pattern in the Old Testament. Then he cannot be Messiah. He can't be Messiah. He must fulfill that pattern. Because he must spend 40 days with us in the wilderness. In that unregenerated state. As stones, dead stones. And then he must spend three days in the, in the tomb with us. Before we can become living stones or lively mm. stones. Mm. Are you still here? Because by the time you add 40 to 3, it becomes 43. And numerically, that is 4 and 3, which is 7. And it is on the seventh day that creation was complete and God entered into rest. So he cannot change stones into bread on the 40th day. It must be after 43 days. So he can fulfill that pattern. If he had done what Satan asked him to do, he would have nullified his work on earth. He cannot be Messiah. Are you still here? So each time he spoke, Jesus will respond. And finally, he told Jesus to bow before him. He will give him this. He will give him that. And Jesus said, get thee behind me. Jesus won that day because Jesus spoke last. That's the principle of the last, last word. word. Yes, listen to this. The principle of the last word. Now, let me contextualize it. When Jesus died, Satan began to change the narrative about him. The news went around Jerusalem and Israel that Pilate released Barabbas instead of Jesus to show that Jesus was worse off than Barabbas. The situation was so bad even on that night that Peter denied him. And when you read the narrative, when the last person asked and said, are you not a, are you not a part of this, of this man? Your accent betrays you. He said no, and he began to invoke a curse or curses that if I had anything to do with this man, let this happen and let that happen. He was invoking an anathema against himself. So that word spread that even Peter denied him. So the narrative concerning Jesus was turning around to the favor of Satan. And if Jesus had been buried under that condition, his resurrection would not amount much concerning the work of the church because he would have been subject to a lie and therefore been under the control of Rome. Mm. He could not overcome the world. Are you following what I'm saying? Because the last word that was spoken about Jesus was negative and impeached the credibility of his sonship. So God had to do something. 
because God knows about the principle of the last word. He established it in scripture. What did he do? He brought darkness for three hours and there was a violent earthquake. And when the centurion, the commander of the Roman army that was standing by the cross, observing these things, when he saw the darkness for three hours, when he saw and heard the earthquake, he was moved and the Bible said he spoke the last word. <laughs> Hallelujah. He said truly this was the son of God. That was the last word. In other words, he discountenanced everything that had been spoken about Jesus and used the Greek word aletos of a truth. In other words, everything else that has been said about this man is a lie of the truth this notice the definite article this was the son of god and he uses the exact word for sonship that jesus is called by god there are five greek words that translate the word son or our sonship in the bible the first one is brephos as newborn babies desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby in the book of peter so you have Brephos, you have Nepios, you have Pideon, you have Technon, and you have Huios, which is the highest level of sonship. And this is the word that God uses to describe his relationship with Jesus. In the book of Hebrews, the Bible says that God had in this last day spoken to us through his son, Huios, whom he had appointed heir of all things and by whom he created the heavens and the earth, created all things. So. When the centurion spoke, he called him by his exact title, what he claimed to be, that the Jews said he lied about and they crucified him for. But he spoke the last word and said, of a truth, this was the wheels of Almighty God. You say, Pastor, how is that relevant? I'll tell you. When Joshua died, his spin doctors went to town and they began to praise him. And began to say things that were contrary to what we believed about him. And began to whip up sentiments and the pathos regarding his death. In the sentimentality of that death. Right. And people began to say, oh, maybe he was not really as bad as we thought he was. Or maybe he was just a man of God that was misunderstood. Nice. Or maybe it was nice out word. of jealousy that people said all of these things about him. It was a campaign of calumny. And they began to turn the narrative. Pastors, men, authentic men of God were unable to speak. The, the social media was awash with encomiums concerning this man. God knew that if Joshua was buried on that, that kind of narrative, his death will bring a greater number of Joshuas. They will proliferate in our nation because Satan has had the last word. Last word. So, he gave me the honor of speaking the last word concerning this man. Now, for me to speak the last word, I must find a pattern in the scripture that corroborates what I'm going to say. Because if I just come and say, well, Joshua is not a, a true man of God, is this and that, he doesn't follow any pattern in scripture and therefore he has no spiritual significance. I must find a pattern in scripture that represents what he is. And I found it in 1 Samuel, in the 28th chapter, where Saul went to the witch at Endor. Because at this point in time, he's facing the Philistines and he's overwhelmed by trepidation. The fear has taken hold of his heart. He doesn't know what to do. He tries to contact God, but God ignores him because of his intransigence. And so in his desperation, he, he appeals to his people, where can I find a witch with a familiar spirit who can tell me what I need to hear? And they tell him, there is one at Endor. See, the word endo means the fountain of dwelling. It's a type of the church, but a counterfeit. Because mm. Jesus is the fountain of our dwelling. That's what the church is. He is the fountain of our life. But Satan counterfeits everything that has to do with God. So she is at endo. And so King Saul goes to consult this woman. When he gets there, he says to the woman to bring up Samuel. Now, he knows that the woman is a witch. He knows that the woman has a familiar spirit. He said so himself. But he is desperate. 
And so the woman summons a familiar spirit that comes as Samuel. You say, but is that not the real Samuel? The answer is no. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, the Paul says, if anyone comes to you preaching another gospel, another Jesus, another Holy Spirit, there are counterfeits of the gospel. There is an entity or entities that are called Jesus that are not of this Bible. There is a Holy Spirit that is mentioned that is not of this Bible. And Paul tells us, see, everything that God has, Satan counterfeits. Are you still here? That, that one who came out, that the woman summoned, is not the true Samuel. That's the counterfeit Samuel. You say, how do you know? Because spirits do not age. When Saul asked her, what do you see? She said, I see an old, old man, man covered with a cloak. Yeah. Samuel was already dead. He'd been dead for a while. He's no longer an old man. Spirits don't age. If spirits could age, God would just wait for the demons to die of old age. But they don't age. That's why they are still here, the same way they used to be. When you leave your body, you become the same. You don't change. So the one that she summoned was a familiar spirit. Yes. King Saul knew it, but he was too desperate. And that spirit gave him a prophecy. You say it came to pass. Of course, it's called divination once it violates the word of God. Because the Bible says it's appointed unto men once to die and then, and then the judgment. So if you go to a place to summon that spirit, you've already violated God's word. And whatever that spirit says is not of God. No matter whether it comes to pass or not. Are you still here? See? So that is why I said he is the wizard at Endor. Now notice, I didn't mention his name. Because when the centurion spoke concerning Jesus as the last word, he doesn't call his name. He said, of the truth, this is the Son of God. It describes him in such a way that you recognize who he's speaking about. That is why when it came to the last word, I had to find a pattern in scripture that describes Joshua the way he truly is, without mentioning his name. That's why I called him the wizard at Endor, the fake church. The counterfeit mm. church mm. where people go like King Saul out of desperation. They are not interested in knowing Jesus and him crucified. They are not interested in doctrine and to finding all that pertains to life and godliness. They are looking for temporary solutions to eternal problems. Immediate gratification. That is why it is an endo. And he, as the superintendent of that place, is the wizard at endo. And I mentioned his followers who were mourning him. And I mentioned the source of his power, Lucifer, who took one third of God's angels to indicate to you that the fact that a man has a following or followership does not mean he's of God. That's why I called him the wizard at Endo. I was not insulting him. When Jesus called those Pharisees and Sadducees, serpents and entities of the Ophidian species, he was not insulting them. He was just giving configuration to their spiritual imagery. So I was not insulting Joshua. If I wanted to insult Joshua, I would have summoned the proclivity of the sesquipedalianist and levitated to an altitude of <laughs> grandiloquence that would require at least a decade to unravel the labyrinths of the vital duration. So then it would have amounted to nothing. Unless there is a pattern in scripture that corroborates what I say, that buttresses that point, it has no spiritual significance. And that is why I called him the wizard and endo. And there are many of you who are following that path. I came here to warn you, to let you understand that your time is up. You who are parading yourselves as prophets and arrogated divine honors to yourselves, you take the Bible, God's word, and you analyze it and you intellectualize it and you bring confusion into the body of Christ. You mock the things of the Lord. You have become a scorner. Picato cum in profundum venerit contemnet. When a man comes to the depth of the wickedness of his sin, he becomes a scorner. He's amused by spiritual things. And that is what you have become. You have called yourself a teacher, a pastor, even though there is no pattern here that involves you. And God did not appoint you. And Jesus did not appoint you. 
Do you not know that this word is called the Logos? It is God himself. And you, that woman, you call yourself a prophetess, Jezebel. I want to remind you of what God did to your grandmother, Jezebel, and how he threw her from her balcony. And she had to face the canine ferocity of the four-footed beast. That God has not changed. In the New Testament, he says, I will kill her with death. And that is the spirit of Jezebel. I came to warn you that your time is up. All of you that have brought that confusion and are calling yourselves by names that God did not arrogate to you. And you do this despite to the spirit of grace. I came here to warn you just like I warned Joshua 20 years ago that your time is up. You don't even have any time. Hear the word of the Lord. Oh, full of all subtlety and all mischief, you children of the devil, you enemies of righteousness, will you not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? Behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall descend into blackness and the darkness of his judgments. And if you do not turn away from your acts of insubordination and your intransigence against the thrice holy God, he will smite you into the dust and his people will praise his holy name. For he is the one who sits upon the throne, surrounded mm. by the rainbow of his magnanimity, of right. his benevolence and of his beneficence. Before him are the seven fires of his ubiquitous spirit. And we see the crystal sea of his sacrosanct vicinity. We hear the seraphic chanting of the doxology in the heavenly places. Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, which is, which was, and which is to come. And if you do not turn away from your blasphemy, you will come to realize that our God is a consuming fire. And it is a terrible thing to fall into the hands of the living God. This is your last warning. And I speak this warning to you in the name of the Lord Jesus. My name is Reverend Chris Okotia. I am the Shepherd Superintendent of the Household of God, Ecclesia. Well, well, well. Um, you know, <laughs> if this was a man that just came up and start talking about TB Joshua now, disputing the accuracies of T.B. Joshua's prophecy and disputing the intention of Satan behind T.B. Joshua. It would have been totally a different narrative. But this man has been talking about T.B. Joshua for over 20 years, disputing his authenticity. So it wasn't like he was waiting for him to die. No, 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 no. Go do your research and see. And he has a gift of interpreting scriptures in a way that it is very futuristic. You know, you can hear him use a lot of Latin and Greek words. A lot of some of the words that he uses are like Latin and Greek because he search and go deep and look for the true meaning of these words. That way we can understand actually what scripture is saying. So on this template, you know, I hope that each and every one of us, when we see a prophet, we will use this template to ask questions, to interrogate them, even if it's from a distance. When we listen to them on TV, on radio, online, we will use this template, this pattern, biblical pattern, to identify if they are of God or not. So when we see divination, we would not call it prophecy. So when we see people, prophets, giving their images here and there to our families, to our friends, we know that that way they want to use their spirit to follow them, to terrorize them. Satan comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And that's exactly what happens when we carry this imagery. Reverend Chris Okoti said it. Your time is up. Bushiri, your time is up. Ibad Angel, your time is up. Johnson Suleiman, your time is up. Chris Okoti, Chris uh, Okafo, I mean. Your time is up. Natasha, your time is up. 
Fidelis, your time is up. Mboro, your time is up. Zondo, your time is up. Owuo, your time is up. Time is up. We must, if there's anything that we need to understand, guys, this whole thing that Reverend Okoti just expansiate, it isn't like something new. Right? It's not new to God. It's not new. But because he probed it and sort of like arranged it through the revelation of God, we clearly see it. Somebody said, uh, do not forget Daddy Freeze. Okay, Daddy Freeze, your time is up. I heard that Daddy Freeze was saying, he was disputing Chris Okoti and saying, how can he say that he got the name Joshua because he wanted to imitate Jesus to be a G substitute to deceive people as another Jesus? How about you, my friends who have their names Joshua, your, uh, your, your, the, the, his, his family members or whatever? It's fine, but they had the name Joshua. Their parents gave them the name Joshua with a certain intention. Biblical intention. No satanic agenda. But TB Joshua, being used by Satan, he took the name Joshua. Remember, his name was not Joshua. His name was Abdul Fatai Balogun. Abdul Fatai, which is an Arabic name, which means he has a heritage, he has a lineage of Islam. He took he and he he adopted the name Joshua intentionally because if you look at the Greek, the Latin, and the Hebrew meanings of these names, you see that the names are actually the same. In the spirit realm, his mentor and supporter, Satan, knows that. So everything was intentional. So of course you can have people call themselves Joshua. Their parents, the mother, the father, they knew why they gave him the name Joshua. Because they probably want you to be strong and courageous. They probably want you to lead the people to the promised land or lead them through the desert. But... Joshua, T.B. Joshua's intention for adopting that name was totally different. Totally different. So we must probe these things. We must ask questions. Probing, ask questions. Don't come to look for answers. Come to ask questions, then you can get the answers. Have an attitude of asking questions and questions and keep probing and probing. Sometimes you just pretend that you don't know. That's the best way for us to understand scriptures. To sit down and study. And you saw the principle of the last word. If T.B. Joshua had had the last word... Do you know how many people, even right now, do you know how many people that, not, that didn't totally believe T.B. Joshua, but now they believed him after he died? Do you know if he had had the last word, that would go into the future. That would go into years to come. And that is going to be like a seed that is going to go to the ground and germinate and we're going to have so many more tb joshua's so so many more sh charlatans so many more false prophets across africa we're going to have them so many of them but he cannot have the last word that was why even the morning that tb joshua died i woke up i made a video I said, yeah, his time is up. He was a false prophet. 
I'm not going to praise him. And you have these Africans that will come tell you that you don't speak evil, you don't speak bad of the dead. People who died, you should just rest, you should just allow them. You should don't speak bad of them. Who says that? Where did you get that from? In the Bible? And you are a Christian and you're saying that? No, don't bring your culture into my, my, my spiritual life. There's nowhere in the Bible. What, why do you think in the Bible we get to hear about Solomon and his many sins, David and his many sins, Cain and Abel, there are many sins. So the Bible is speaking bad of them. Why is the Bible speaking bad of them? Because you and I need to learn. That's why we need to, sh we need to tell people, people who passed away, we need to tell the truth about them. The best place where Africans go to lie is when they go to the burial ground, the cemetery. When somebody dies, that's when Africans lie about him. They don't say the truth about him. Ah, he was a good person. Ah, he was a... Please tell the, tell the truth about me. Tell them, say the mistakes that I... That is not going to change anything. I've gone. I'm going to face judgment. I'm dead. That's just the way that it is. And then we keep saying, let him rest in peace. No, all this thing about resting in peace, where did we even get it from? Somebody is dead and you're saying, may his soul rest in peace. No, 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 no. Your words are useless. Your words are empty. Your words would not decide whether he rests in peace or whether he rests in pieces, whether he rests in heaven, whether he rests in hell. Your words would not, would, would not work. So we, we must stop pretending instead of sitting down and evaluating the life of this person and take the lessons that we need to learn from it. But we do not do that. It is... important that we continue to evaluate continue to ask questions continue to probe don't think because he's a mighty man of god then you're not going to ask questions when you hear him preach and teach no ask questions disagree with it if need be tb joshua wanted to have the last word T.B. Joshua have many people that work for him. You don't understand, like you don't understand the network that this guy has built. You do not understand. If this guy was around for another 20 years, you do not understand the kind of destruction, destruction rather, that he would cost. But, it's a good thing that he has passed on because I'm sure God gave him the opportunity. There are certain people that there was even no need for them to be given an opportunity because right from day one, like T.B. Joshua, right from day one, he was sent to cause commotion, conflict, deception in the church from Africa, from Lagos, Nigeria, across Africa and across the world. And unfortunately, he partially succeeded. But now we need to help people to regain their trust in God. Now we need to continue to spread and talk about the truth that God has given us. Somebody died. You know, you know they were living in sin totally and you're saying they should rest in peace. This man had destroyed so many people and you're saying he's going to rest in peace. T.B. Joshua is never going to rest in peace. No, God is a God of justice. TB Joshua is not going to rest in peace at all. Where would he rest in peace? How would he rest in peace? How? Because you do not know the level of atrocities that this man has conducted. All you see is from a distance, you watch him on Emmanuel TV or whatever. You say, man of God, he's giving money. He's helping people. He's saying he's a man of God. Then you're never going to know the person if you don't probe it. That's why I'm saying. Keep probing. 
Probe the word of God. It's important. It's important. Anyway, thank you some of you guys for your message. Um, uh, Christine is saying hypocrites. Why they want him to rest in peace? Because they are also hypocrites, Christine. They are also they also love to sin. You see, people that love to sin, right? They don't want you to criticize somebody that is in sin. They don't want, want you to even criticize them. They are sensitive when you criticize somebody who is living in sin. Because they know they are also living in sin. But they, don't, they tend to forget that you are not living in sin. And they also tend to forget that criticizing something is not a sin. It's not wrong. It's just evaluating the state of the thing and saying the truth. Truth comes from judgment. Truth comes from criticism. When you say, ah, don't judge him and all that. How would you know the truth if you do not judge? The Bible says we should judge righteously. The Bible says we should judge those who are in the church, who are Christians. We actually have no right to judge those who are not Christians because they do not believe in scripture. Chief Iron Babe here is saying, Brother Solomon, you got that right. Evil people don't want evil criticized. Exactly. They do not want it. It took me a long time to understand that. Maybe because I was just too honest or gullible. I would talk about somebody and then this person would say, ah, they disagree with you, whatever. And then later on, you find out they're doing the same thing. They're cheating on their wife doing the same thing. And that was when I was like, that's it. When I see people criticizing if you're criticizing righteousness, a call for righteousness, it means that you are okay with being unrighteous and you're living in unrighteousness. If you are criticizing a call for holiness, it means that you are living an unholy life and you're okay with it. You don't want anyone to touch it. If you are living, if you are criticizing the truth, it means that you're okay with things that are false and you yourself are living a life full of falsehood. We must wake up. We must wake up. Now we must wake up. Now we must wake up. That's just the way that it is. We must wake up. That man was a disgrace. T.B. Joshua was a disgrace to Africa. He was a total disgrace. He's a total disgrace to this continent. I'm ashamed as a Nigerian that I actually he was Nigerian. Just like I'm ashamed that Hush Puppy is Nigerian. I'm just looking at, uh, let me see some of the comments here. Lolo say, uh, truth, uh, Harry, I see you. I see you, Puna, <laughs> my sister, it's been a while. I see you. Life season says, I see nothing good in TB Joshua. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Not today, not tomorrow. Not in the future. Absolutely nothing. Enough is enough. We face that 
over and over again. We've seen that in so many different people. We've seen that in a lot has been destroyed because of these people. If you know Chris Oyakilome, sorry, Chris Okoti, he defends biblical truth in a lot of ways. And you see, in a country like Nigeria, where we are okay with living in sin, you know the way Nigerians are okay with living in sin? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but that's just the truth. I was actually checking out statistics yesterday that was released. You know, they said every one in four Nigerian young person is involved in cyber criminality. It's a Yahoo boy. One in four young person, youth then you have to worry about our future. A country where they don't care where you make your money from, as long as you share with them, it's fine. They don't care you made it from Yahoo, as long as you bring it from church. They don't care whether you make it from drug trafficking, as long as you bring it to church. They don't care whether you made it from, from the government, you stole corruption, as long as you bring it to church, it's fine. That's a problem. That's why you see people like them, Jeremiah, in Wari, Suleiman, they will keep speaking out. No, we cannot. We cannot. We cannot just continue that way. So guys, please keep praying. Keep praying. Keep praying for people to people to see the truth and understand the truth and keep praying for God to God to keep revealing the truth to people. Uh, yeah, keep praying, guys. Uh, hmm. Yeah. So... Let's believe that the time for the church, for the real church to rise up is now. You know, um, and we have to uncompromise. We have to not compromise at all. We cannot be Christians in this area of our life and that area we're not Christians. I'm a Christian at home and I'm not Christian at work. I'm a Christian in church and I'm not Christian as a husband, you know, as a wife, I just do whatever I want to do. That's not God. But please watch out for these false prophets. They're coming up and God will continue to expose them. God will continue to vindicate his church, a true church, the remnant in the church. God would do that. Yeah, some people are still on daddy freeze. American England, daddy freeze is a hypocrite. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, so thank you guys. Uh, may God bless you. May he continue to help us, to continue to stand on truth, no matter what is going to cost us, to believe him for the supernatural. He's our God. He is the almighty, omnipotent, omnipresent all powerful that's our god so guys please make sure you subscribe um to this channel um
yeah, make sure you subscribe to the channel and please make sure you like the video just so it's gonna, YouTube can put it out there. Make sure you like. Let's get a thousand likes right now. Please just click like, 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 and also click subscription. Subscribe. If you haven't subscribed yet, please subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. Please subscribe, 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 subscribe. Thank you, guys. God bless you. The Bible says we shall know the truth and the truth shall set us free. Have a wonderful day. Psalm 23. God has set a table for two. One share for himself, the king, and the second one, believe it or not, is for you. But of course, the enemy wants a seat at the table too. Anxiety wants a seat. Envy wants a seat. Worry and frustration want a seat. But don't give the enemy a seat at your table. Look up, go up, you're invited up the mountain of God. Move towards infinite power, splendor, love and beauty, healing and restoration. When we gaze upon the Almighty, we are changed by the captivation. Empowered to take every thought captive in the battle of the mind. Shame is silenced by His glory and our future redefined. So draw near to Jesus. The shepherd is good. Our God is faithful. Take the place prepared for you. And don't give the enemy a seat at your table. Aha! So Airpeace has now commenced direct flights to Dakar, Freetown and Banjul from Lagos. Yeah! So start planning your trip, because Airpeace got you! Lagos to Dakar, Freetown and Banjul flights will operate on Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays with the superb Embraer 195E2 jets. Fly Airpeace from Lagos to Dakar, Freetown, Banjul and enjoy a world-class travel experience on the brand new E195. For bookings, head to our website flyairpeace.com or download the Airpeace mobile app on Play Store or App Store. Airpeace, your peace, our goals.